Hey, time to get going. Today we're going to talk about what goes on inside the operating system at a fairly high level and how file management works also at a fairly high level. Computers start with this process called bootstrapping and the first part of it is that a bootstrap loader, which is sometimes called a mini loader or initial program loader, IPL, is stored in read-only memory. So that thing runs when the computer is powered up. It is the job of the bootstrap loader to look for the operating system program loader and it finds that on disk either in a master boot record or in something called a Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, UEFI. You do not need to remember that. That's something that you look up if you need it, right? That is the successor to the master boot record. At any rate, when it finds either one of those two OS program loaders, it loads uh, whichever one it finds into read-only memory and transfers control to the code from either the UEFI or MBR, which then runs. The boot code can load an OS, or you may have heard of and maybe even have a dual boot machine that will run one or another operating system depending on what you choose at startup time. So either we load the operating system or we load another loader program that will let us choose which operating system to run. In, a, in any case, some operating system runs, and the loader program that is part of the operating system is responsible for, responsible for loading and executing user programs. So that's the startup mechanism. There are a number of internal functions for the operating system. We're going to talk about these process scheduling CPU scheduling, file management. We talked about memory management and virtual memory last time. There are a number of functions of the operating system. The file manager takes logical file requests and trans transforms them into physical I.O. requests and then runs the physical I.O. requests. The I.O. control system does resource allocation, that is allocating I.O. devices to processes and device management. Memory management determines whether it's possible to load a program into memory and then does so. And we talked about the details of that last time. The scheduler allocates time for programs to execute. Here's a list of operating system services Network services manages communication. File management translates logical file requests. The I.O. control system, I.O.C.S. I'm having trouble with my voice this morning. Um, the I.O.C.S. does device management and resource allocation. Memory management loads programs into memory and allocates memory. Scheduling allocates execution time and the, the monitor or kernel, it's usually called the kernel these days, provides overall control of the computer while the operating system is running. We said that a multi-programming system is one that can run multiple programs at the same time, and actually, I probably should have said concurrently, if there's only one CPU, there's only one program running. So the operating system has to allocate CPU time, memory, input, and output to all of the processes that are running. There are different scheduling routines for different objectives. And I'll give you an example. If I have a program that runs in the background, say it's going to do the payroll for Delta Airlines, that's, that's a lot of work, right? Thousands of employees. And as long as it finishes today so that we can pay the Delta employees, it kind of doesn't make any difference whether it runs really, really fast or only kind of sort of fast. On the other hand, we want the interaction with the keyboard and the screen to be snappy so that when you move the mouse, the mouse pointer on the screen moves. And so we're going to schedule that interactive part differently then we schedule the long-running batch program. 
So a process is the basic unit of work for the operating system. And you can, um, for you Windows types, you can see a process list when you open the task manager. A process is a program together with all of the resources, including data, that are associated with it. So it's not just the program, it's the program and everything that it needs. The program is a binary file with instructions in machine language, okay? A process is that program being executed. And every process has a process identifier or PID or PID that the operating system uses to manage those processes. Process creation. Processes are created by some other process, uh, except, for, except for that initial bootstrap that we talked about a little bit earlier. That creates a process within the operating system. That process could be called forking, spawning, or cloning, depending on the operating system. And it doesn't, um, the, the verb doesn't really make very much difference. Many operating systems have this idea of a parent process and a child process. The parent process can start other processes, and they are called child processes. Usually, if you stop the parent process, its child processes are stopped as well. The process context is all of the relevant register data, including the program counter. So if I've saved the context of a process, I can stop it, interrupt it, and then restart it at the same point where it was stopped. Restart it transparently. So a process control block, and this is a sort of idealized one, it doesn't match any particular operating system, but it's a block of data for each process in the system. It has all the relevant information about the process. So if you notice in the middle there, there's a place for the program counter, and then there's something called register save area. That is a place to store all the rest of the registers. Memory pointers store pointers into memory that has been allocated. And there are a bunch of other things there. Um, so as I said, that's a typical one. It isn't specific to any one operating system. There are three primary states for a process. I guarantee you this is on the final. I guarantee it. Just like that guy who sold suits on late night television long ago. Um, the ready state, a process that is in the ready state, could run if a CPU were available. A process that's in the running state is actually being run by a CPU. It's using CPU time. If I have a computer with only one CPU, there's only one process in the running state. If I have a computer with eight cores, which is really eight CPUs, I can have eight processes in the running state, one for each core. The waiting or blocked state, a process is waiting for something to happen outside of the process. And usually that is some service from the operating system like read a file and put the data where I can get it. Dispatching is moving a process from the ready state to the running state. And the operating system's dispatcher will usually have a queue of processes in the ready state, more than one process that could run. And so it's the job of the dispatcher to pick which process is going to run next and assign it to a CPU. Wake up, move a process from a blocked state to the ready state. I just tend to say move it from waiting to ready rather than remembering wake up. But if you write wake up on an exam question, I will recognize what it is. Timeout, that is from running to ready, and it happens when a process's time quantum has expired. Process completion, depending on the operating system, we say that the process is killed, terminated, destroyed, any one of these words that bring to mind something dramatic. But really, the process stops and its resources are released back to the operating system. 
there are additional states a process could be suspended or swapped out to disk so that it doesn't run for a pretty long time. I'm talking about tens or even hundreds of milliseconds. Resumption is getting that suspended state back to the ready state. The CPU runs a number of scheduling tasks. Actually, the CPU runs them all right, but it's the operating system that has these scheduling tasks. High-level scheduling is starting a new program. Short-term scheduling, deciding which process is going to run next. That's also called dispatching. Mid-level, moving processes to or from disk. I.O. scheduling. I.O. scheduling, remember that the CPU is six orders of magnitude, roughly a million times faster than a magnetic disk. And so we can afford to spend some CPU time trying to optimize the use of that disk. So here's a diagram, and this diagram is also in your textbook. The textbook is your friend. It's free. It's in D2L. It has an index. I noticed when I was grading homework yesterday that not everyone has discovered the index yet. In any course that has a textbook, the index is your friend. You come across a term you've never heard of before, look in the index. So here's the picture of how all of those pieces fit together. A process may be running, and that's the bubble at the top left. One of two things happens, either actually one of three things, but in the ordinary process of running, Either it makes an I.O. request, and that moves it to the blocked state until the operating system finishes that I.O. request. Remember, we have privileged instructions so that only the operating system can do I.O. The other, the other thing that can get it out of running without ending it is that its time slot has expired. The third thing is that the program ends. And in this case, the program itself has done something there's something in the program logic that says I'm done, and it signals the operating system that it's done. The operating system recovers that program's resources and doesn't do anything with it anymore. A program that is in the blocked state moves to the ready state when, it, when whatever it asks the operating system to do is complete. A program that's in the ready state can move to the running state when there's a CPU available. And it's the operating system's dispatcher that decides which of the many ready programs is going to run next. So what are the objectives? Minimal, that is fast, and consistent response time. And I will tell you that consistent response time is far more important than minimal response time. If you work with a machine where there's a tenth of a second delay when you move the mouse, you will get used to that. You might not like it, but you'll get used to it, and you can work with it. If you are working with a machine that mostly the operating system responds instantly when you move the mouse, but once in a hundred times there's a tenth of a second delay, you're going to notice that, and it's going to frustrate you. So consistent response time is more important than minimal response time. We want to maximize CPU utilization, and that might not seem intuitive at first. But the CPU is our, our source of getting work done, and we want it to be working all the time, or at least as much of the time as we can. Maximize resource utilization. Once again, that might be counterintuitive, but we want to use all of our resources to get the jobs finished. Degrade gracefully. I would not like everything just to come to a screeching halt. I want things to slow down and keep working when the load increases. Prevent starvation, and that one is in bold. If I have a mix of programs running, Depending on how the operating system's dispatcher works, it might be that some poor old program with a low priority and a high demand for I.O. never gets the use of the CPU. That is starvation. That program will never finish. So how, how do we do dispatching, that is moving from ready to running? Well, 
we could do first in, first out. That is unfair to short processes and to I.O. bound processes. An I.O. bound process is one that does a lot of input and output. And so the biggest part of the clock time that it takes that process to finish is waiting for input or output. And so if I have an I.O. bound process, it's going to run, it's going to ask for I.O., and then it goes back to that waiting queue. Okay, and it'll be waiting for a while if we're doing first in, first out. Priority scheduling, we might run the job with the highest priority first. And if we have multiple jobs with the same high priority, we probably do something like first in, first out with them. Preemptive dispatching means kicking somebody off of the CPU so that some other process can run. And I will give you an example of why you would do that. Suppose I want to compute pi to 500 digits. And then I'm going to display the answer on the screen. Right, there's a lot of computation getting the first 500 digits of pi. And then there's one output. Put it on the screen. I don't want everything else to stop while my compute 500 digits of pi process is running. I want to share that time. And so that is preemptive dispatching. That process that's computing 500 digits of pi will get kicked off the CPU repeatedly so that other processes can run. Round robin means do this one, then this one, then the next one, then the next one, and come back to the first one. That is inherently fair. Every process gets an equal chance. Dynamic priority is actually an improvement. We take the ratio of CPU time to total time. So how, how long has this process been running and how much CPU time has it used? The smallest ratio, the one that's using the littlest amount of CPU time, has the highest priority because we can guess that as soon as it gets the CPU, it's going to do something like request an I.O. operation, and it'll be back to the wait state. A thread, and we can go much more deeply into this if we talk about Intel's idea of threads. That is for an operating system course or maybe a computer science operating system course. For this course, a thread is a mini process that is independent of other parts of the same process. So event-driven programs like that mouse handler, the thread shares its parent's process control block. So there's only one process control block, and it shares the resources allocated to the parent process. The difference is that the thread can execute independently of that parent process. Advantages reduced operating system overhead, and a thread needs less information than the normal process control block. All right, disk scheduling, and we're talking about magnetic disks now. The CPU is about a million times faster than a magnetic disk, and it's over a thousand times faster than a solid state drive. Because the disk is comparatively slow, it makes sense to use some CPU time to optimize disk operations. Okay. The seek operation for magnetic disks, moving the heads from one track to another, is the most time consuming of the three parts of access time. Remember, we had seek rotational latency and then transfer time, with the seek time being the most important, the most time consuming one of those. The goal of disk scheduling, the operating system's goal, is to minimize seek operations. I want to do as few of those as I can. The first come first serve algorithm is a kind of naive approach. We can be all over the surface of the disk seeking forward, backward, and maybe even sideways. Shortest distance first starts to make sense because remember, 
the, the time it takes to move the head is roughly proportional to the distance. There's some start and stop time in there too, but it's roughly proportional to the distance. The problem with that is that a process that needs a disk block far away can be postponed indefinitely. If I've got a process, some processes using right the outer edge of the disk, and I've got one that needs the inner part of the disk, it can be postponed indefinitely. Instead, we use this thing called the elevator algorithm or the scan algorithm. If you think about a building elevator, the elevator goes up until there are no more requests to move up. Then it turns around and moves down until there are no more requests to move down. Then it goes back to going up. It only changes direction when it has run out of requests for the direction that in which it was going. The elevator algorithm for disk scheduling does the same thing. It doesn't change directions until all requests in the current direction have been served. So the disk head moves more or less smoothly from the outer edge to the center of the disk, then more or less smoothly from the center of the disk back to the outer edge. And it doesn't go any further than it needs to in either direction. Now there's a possible disadvantage there that the middle of the disk gets serviced twice. I go, I pass that middle of the disk when I'm going from the outside to the inside. I pass it again when I'm going in the other direction. Microsoft and other operating systems have taken advantage of that. The page file that is used for virtual memory is often in that center of the disk, where the page file, which is kind of important to performance, will get disk service twice in each pass from each, each round trip of the disk head. Okay, a file is a named collection of data on non-volatile storage. We'll talk about what a cluster is in a moment, but every file requires at least one cluster. There's one exception to that. It's very small files. And files may be associated to programs. So Windows has a table of file extension to program association. So if you double click a .docx file, um, Word will usually run, but you can change that. If you want to run something else when you double click a .docx file, you can change the table. Apple and Mac OS store that association within the file itself in in an extension, not, a, not an extension part of the name, but in a branch to the file itself. The file management system provides a logical view of files and hides most of the physical implementation. The file management system manages the directory structure. It manages space allocation on the I.O. device. It permits manipulation of data within a file, requests data transfers, of the I.O. device drivers, that is the file management system, when it wants a data transfer, asks the I.O. device driver to do the transfer. Whatever file security and file integrity protections there are, are also part of the file management system. Man, back when I had to get up early and shovel coal into the computer, we also allocated disk space by hand with a pencil and a chart of what the disk looked like. Isn't it nice that we don't do that anymore? Keeping file management and I.O. separate, um, the I.O. device can change without changing the file system, and redirecting data from one kind of device to another is simple. So here's a list of operations that we can perform as a whole. We're doing something to the whole file, and the file management system just does that for us. Copy it or move it, list it, print it, load and execute it if it's a program, load a file into memory, and we can do that with data files, store a file from memory, append data to the end of a file, or if it is a source program, we can copy or assemble it. Stream operations view the file as a stream of bytes, and the operations we can perform are open it, 
read some number of bytes, write some number of bytes, move the file pointer, and you can think of that as your finger stuck in the page of a book, move the file pointer forward or backward, move the file pointer to the beginning or the end, close the file. Some files allow us to perform record operations. In this case, the file is a collection of records, usually fixed length. We can still open it and also close it, but now we can retrieve a particular record, add a record to the file, delete a record from the file, update a record, or close the file. So three possible access methods for files. How are we doing? Sequential, I read it from the beginning to the end. Direct or random, I read a particular byte or set of bytes from the file without starting at the beginning, or indexed, and we'll talk about indexed in a minute. In sequential access, we read from beginning to end, and the majority of files are accessed sequentially. Program source and binary files, obviously, you read that program source file into an editor and then write it back out. The binary file is read into memory by the loader. Sound, video, and pictures. I need the whole file if I'm going to do sound, video, or picture. Random access assumes the file is made of fixed length logical records, um, which is almost never a good assumption. It was a good assumption when files were on tabulating cards with holes punched in them. One way of locating a record on a file is this thing called hashing. And that allows us to compute for a file key the location of a logical record. So here's a simple hashing example. If I look up the ASCII values for BROWN, they're 66, 114, 111, 119, 110. I add them all together and I get 520. I would put the file, the record for Brown at location 520. And now if I want to read the record for Brown, I can compute using, using the key, the name in this case, I can compute 520 and go straight to that record. Now, that is not as cool as it sounds. First of all, because there are a lot of Browns and there's a fair number of Bob Browns. The problem then is a collision. And so we would use, first of all, a more sophisticated hashing algorithm that would do better to minimize collisions. But then we provide a way of linking from the first Brown to the next one so that when we do inevitably have a collision, there's a way to deal with it. Indexed access uses two or more physical files. There's the base file, and that's where the data are. But then we maintain an index file with pointers into the base file. So we might write the record for Brown wherever we happen to be in the file when we get to it. But now we're going to update an index file to remember where we put that record for Brown. The index files get organized so that they're accessible by key, in this case, name. So find the record with employee number 115030. We'd look in the index for 115030, and it would tell us the physical location on the disk that, to find that record. So I can find not just a record with name Brown, I can find all of them this way. Now I told you a little, a little bit ago that I file with particular exceptions, always occupies one cluster. A block is a segment of disk, and usually in modern disks, the block size is determined when the disk is manufactured. Modern disks tend to have 4,096-byte blocks, older disks 512-byte blocks. The cluster is the collection of blocks used by the operating system as one physical unit. Clusters are also called allocation units. And for example, we might have a 64K cluster size. That means if I have a file that is 1K bytes, it's going to occupy 64K on the disk. 
And if you look at Windows, it will tell you the size of a file and the amount of space that it's taking on the disk, and this is why. Often you can control the cluster size when you install an operating system. Um, large cluster sizes waste space because on average one half of the last cluster is unused. Large clusters and small files make things worse. If I have a bazillion files of a few hundred bytes each and 64K clusters, I have wasted a lot of disk space. Disk space is pretty cheap these days, but even so, you can't just sort of throw it away profligately. One almost never gets to use profligate in a sentence. If I am lucky, I can build files contiguously. That means consecutive clusters hold the file, and I can read cluster, 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 moving the disk head minimally, okay? Access is simple for both sequential and direct access, but I gotta have enough space, and I gotta know how big the file's gonna be before I start writing it, because that's how I know how much space to allocate. I have to consider that the file is likely to grow. I have to consider that if it outgrows the space I allocated, I might have to move it. I won't be, I, I won't be able to keep it contiguous without moving it. And when I delete files, there are holes where deleted files used to be in the file structure of the disk. To minimize fragmentation, I have the same kind of problem that I had minimizing memory fragmentation, which we talked about last time. I can use first fit or best fit. No matter what I do, the disk becomes fragmented anyway, sooner or later. Defragmenting means moving a whole bunch of files around. Hey, listen up. Solid state drives do not need to be defragmented and should not be defragmented. All right, do not need to be is that the seek operation, the go find out where this block of the file is, happens electronically. It does not involve moving a physical disk head. Should not be is because there's a limited number of writes in the lifetime of a solid state drive. And when you defragment it, you do a whole lot of writes that didn't really accomplish anything. So you have reduced the working life of the drive without increasing the speed of access. There's an important thing to take away for when you go to work. And that's the sort of thing that a boss my age might ask you, well, why shouldn't we defragment this drive? And now you can tell them. How cool is that? All right, indexed allocation allows non-contiguous or discontiguous allocation. All the links are stored together in one or more blocks called the index block or blocks. There's one set of index blocks per file. Fragmentation is less of a problem. It's still there, but it's less of a problem. And if I have indexed access, I can do random access to files. Disadvantage i got to access the index, so there's an additional disk seek. Directory operations, I create a new, and now I'm, I'm working on the directory, not the file. I can create a new empty file, move a file from one directory to another. Listen up. When I move a file from one directory to another on the same disk, all I am doing is changing where the name of that file is in the directory structure. I haven't physically moved anything. So if I have a Humongo file and I want to move it from directory B Brown to directory shared, I read the directory block for B Brown, write the directory block for shared, and I'm done. The Humongo file stays right where it was. Okay? All right. Rename a file. Once again, all I'm doing is rewriting a directory entry. Append one file to another. Now I'm moving some pointers around, but I still don't have to move any data. Delete a file. Okay. Now, the Unix operating system and Linux works the same way, 
has this thing called an inode. An inode is a mechanism for doing indexed file allocation. The index block has the file attributes like its name. It's got some number of direct blocks. And then it's got, actually it's probably got 12 direct blocks, not 10. And then it's got single, double, and triple indirect blocks. There's a picture coming up. The Unix mechanism is very fast for small files, but it can accommodate files of hundreds of Gibby bytes. I need to remember to fix that. So here's the picture that I promised you. The inode has, first of all, the information about the file. Then it's got pointers to direct data blocks, and there are 12 of those, actually. Block number 13 points to a block of pointers to indirect data blocks. 14 points to double indirect pointers. And 15 doesn't fit on the slide, but it points to triple indirect pointers. So I can get very, very big files. But for small files, I go instantly to pointers to the data blocks of the file. This is cool. This was invented by guys in the 1960s who could not imagine a file of hundreds of Gibby bytes, but this will work with it. And Windows uses this thing called the NT file system, NTFS. It's been around since 1993. Holy smoke, it's old. It's almost as old as I am. I can change the size of a disk volume if I have room. A volume can be a piece of one disk or it can span many disks. I can make a really big disk volume out of a small, out of a number of physical disks. The master file table, MFT, is made out of records of one kibibyte, byte, 1024 bytes. The first 16 records are descriptive of the master file table itself. Then each file has a master file table entry. And here is the exception to every file occupies one cluster. Very small files, a few bytes, are stored directly in that 1K byte master file table. So I read the master file table to find a pointer to the file, and instead I find the data, and I'm done. Okay, NTFS uses this thing called access control lists. That can give us very granular control over file sharing. So I can, instead of just being able to read, write, and execute, I can say whether someone can read a file, append to it, load it into memory, and so on. The NTFS journals the file metadata. The metadata is the descriptive data about the file. And journaling makes a backup copy of that data. It can do file compression. It can do encryption. You can turn those on or off. It can do this thing called a volume shadow copy. As disk volumes get big, the time it takes to back up a disk increases. The volume shadow copy is a feature of, of the file system of NTFS that says, I will store all of the updates to a file separately so that the backup can read a copy of the, of the whole disk just as it was when the backup started. But if anybody else wants to say, look at email, I'm going to be able to pull in those updates and show them the current status. What this means is you do not have to stop everything in order to make a, a good backup. Without volume shadow copy, you either have to stop all other programs from running or you risk getting a backup that is incomplete. So say I'm backing up a whole volume and one of the first things that gets backed up is the file that's holding email. And now I'm busy backing up the rest of the volume and email comes in. It's not on my backup because I've already backed up the email file. 
The volume shadow copy prevents that. Transactions, which are now deprecated and probably do not exist in Windows 10 or 11, would allow updates to a number of files either to succeed or fail as a whole. So if the transaction succeeds, all of the files have been updated, and if it fails, none of them have. So there's nothing partway updated. Free space management, this is how you manage the, the space that is not in use for files. The bitmap method has one bit for each cluster. Remember, the cluster is the number of disk blocks that is one file allocation unit. And the bits are one if the cluster is used. It's a zero if it's free. I can search through it quickly and find some number of contiguous free clusters if that many exist. The linked list method just has a pointer to the first free cluster, and each free cluster has a pointer to the next one. I allocate from the beginning and put deleted files at the end of that linked list. Directory structure is a way to organize a logical view of the files. The directory structure is a way to organize files so that human beings can deal with it easily and to separate that logical structure from whatever the physical organization on the disk is. So it hides the whole physical device from the logical view. File attributes get stored in the directory, things like the file name. Partitions are independent subsections of a device like a magnetic disk or a solid state drive. A volume is the directory structure for a partition, and it needs to be incorporated somewhere into the overall file system. Windows uses drive letters to do that, although you can use the, that backslash backslash notation. Um, Unix uses mount points, and so the whole file structure appears to be in one place, even if it's on more than one physical volume. The tree structure directory, which is the one we're all used to, is hierarchical with a top-level directory, and all other directories are flow from that. All the directories and all the files have names. We use a separator for typing a path. It is the forward slash in Unix, the backward slash in Windows and Microsoft's disk operating system, which is where it came from. The path name can be either an absolute path name or a relative path name. The absolute path name is the full path starting from the root directory of the, of the file system. A relative path is starting from the current directory. A search path, which is something the operating system stores, is directory locations to be checked to locate files. So using Windows again as an example, all the places where executable files could be are on the search path. And now when you try to execute a file, the operating system can find it. So here's a picture of the tree structure directory. There is a root which actually would, in this case, contain the structures, windows, users, program files, and temp. Users has, a sub, has subdirectories, Adams, Baker, and Charles. Uh, Baker has two more subdirectories and then files Delta and Echo in there. Charles has a subdirectory but no files. Adams doesn't have any files either. They haven't done any work. Modern operating systems allow links between directories so that the directory structure need not be strictly hierarchical. And when we have links between those branches, that's called a directed acyclic graph. Easy access, possible cycles, or dangling links, links that don't point anywhere. And I'll show you the cycle in a minute. Windows has shortcut links, uh, shortcuts, links, and junctions. Unix has hard and symbolic links. Macintosh has aliases, but there's really, underneath the Mac OS filing system, file system, is really Unix these days. Here is a directed acyclic graph directory. If I am in Charles's 2024 directory, 
I can see the subdirectory projects, which is actually part of Baker's directory structure. Uh, for, for file protection, we have passwords. In Unix, we have read, write, and execute. In NTFS, we have an access control list with much more granular permissions. Unix has read, write, and execute, and also owner, group, and everyone. And so I can combine read, write, and execute with owner, group, everyone, and get nine possibilities. The resilient file system, ReFS, was introduced in Windows Server in 2012, so a long time ago. Uh, and we still don't really still don't really see it out in the wild. It was supposed to be a replacement for NTFS. Uses 64-bit numbers for file sizes. That means I can get very big files and even very large directories. Has built-in self-checks with redundancy and error correction. Can include as part of the file system, not separately, mirroring redundancy and parity redundancy. It used to be usable only for data storage. You could not have the operating system on a ReFS file system, but now it is possible to boot from a ReFS file system. If you build a, a vanilla Windows server these days, it still has an NTFS file system. The ZFS file system, which doesn't, the ZFS, Z doesn't stand for anything. File system probably does, was originally developed by Sun Microsystems. Oracle bought out Sun, and there is a, an Oracle proprietary version of ZFS, but there's also an open ZFS. So you can use the ZFS file system without buying stuff from Oracle. 128-bit values, huge files and file systems, checksums for everything, redundancy with both mirroring and parity, and something called RAID Z, which overcomes those timing problems that we had with RAID 5. However, finding an operating system that will support ZFS is a certain amount of adventure. Network operating system services let us access files on other computers on the network. Print services redirect print requests to the network and to a network managed printer. There are services for sharing other peripherals like scanners, messaging services built into operating systems, application program interface network services, and security management services. All of these are offered to some extent by every modern operating system and remote processing i forgot okay so network file access works this way a file request goes to the file manager's steering function local requests go to the local os file manager but remote requests go to a network file manager which talks across the network to a file manager on a remote system usually a server one of the problems that an operating system can run into is deadlock. Two processes, each of which has resources that the other one needs. I have a machine with two tape drives. My process grabs one of them. Somebody else's process grabs the other one. Now I need the second one, and the other process needs the first one. Neither of us can advance. We end up with a situation situation like that one. That is deadlock. Operating systems can try to prevent deadlock, try to avoid deadlock, try to detect and recover from it. A deadlock example, I've just gave you an example. Um, two programs and two tape drives. Time passes, each program runs, one of them needs something the other one has, there isn't any left, and neither one of them can, can proceed. Both programs will wait forever unless the operating system does something. Either program would have been okay if the other one hadn't been running at the same time. Recovery, the operating system detects deadlock and blows one or the other of the programs out of the water. 
Okay, now the other one can finish. Or swap the other one to disk and free its memory. The other process runs. The process that was swapped out can come in and run. Resources like optical drives aren't really preemptible. Deadlock prevention, most costly in efficiency. One way to do that is to have a program declare at the beginning all the resources it's going to need. And only if the operating system can grant all of those resources is the program allowed to run. The problem with that is that a program may not know at the beginning what resources it's going to need. The program might need, for example, more memory and not know that. Deadlock avoidance. The operating system maintains this idea of a safe level of each resource. This is called the banker's algorithm. Bankers know how much cash they need in the branch bank to do business every day. A process announces but doesn't necessarily allocate the maximum amount of each resource. So now I don't necessarily have to have all of that available right now. The OS will not grant resources that would leave the pool below the safe level. That is the banker's algorithm. A bank has a safe level of cash. There's enough cash to meet the customer's needs. But if Brown comes in with a check for $100,000 and says, hey, I want to cash this, that doesn't happen. Deadlock detection is simple to implement because deadlocks are allowed to occur, but there's badness when things go wrong. The OS attempts to detect deadlocks, that is the everything stops condition, and even attempting to detect deadlocks is time consuming. Recovery could include terminating one of the processes. That'll release its resources, but then one has to undo the work the process has already done and then restart the process. So that is the end of what was supposed to happen. We did take questions from those who were in class.